Welcome. This is the virtual version of the International Conference of Secular AA, December 5th, 2020. Our first Zoom International Conference. This was our first speaker. Dr. George Koob is talking about alcohol use disorder in the time of COVID-19 and the challenges for AA. Dr. Koob is the director of the National Institute for Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, NIAAA. He's an internationally renowned expert on alcohol and stress and the neurobiology of alcohol and drug addiction. Find out more about NIAA at www.niaaa.nih.gov. Here we go, <laughs> about two minutes in to ICSA 2020. Recovery from alcohol use disorder is attainable and, and often re includes relapse as part of the process. The conceptual framework I've illustrated here um, basically is an argument that there are different stages. Um, they're color coded with the brain regions that are uh, responsible for those different stages and the functional domains that are disrupted. So in the binge intoxication stage, um, it's incentive salience and pathological habits. And of course, the blue there is the basal ganglia, uh, where the, these deficits are, are medi mediated. For the negative affect withdrawal stage, you have reward deficits and a stress surfeit, and that's the extended amygdala there in red inside the deep inside the brain. And then you know, the craving stage or the preoccupation anticipation stage where, stage where we have executive function deficits. And that's mediated by largely cortical and allocortical structures. But you can see you don't have to be a neuroanatomist to see that this is largely cortical in the green. And this has provided us with a, a, a way to really make significant advances in understanding, you know, uh, targets for treatment, behavioral treatments and where they work and 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 when people are, are actually uh, afflicted and, and how severely and, and when they will have recovered, we hope, in the future. So here's some things that we've accomplished in epidemiological research has enabled us to track progress and challenges associated with alcohol misuse in the United States. Advances in understanding the genetics of alcohol use disorder have implications for prevention and precision medicine. Research has established that the adolescent brain is uniquely vulnerable to the effects of alcohol. Longitudinal studies that assess predictors and consequences of adolescent alcohol consumption continue to inform prevention and treatment strategies. Understanding the role of stress neurobiology and alcohol misuse has implications for risk and recovery from AUD. Um, there's a menu of effective behavioral therapies for treatment of AUD. There are currently three FDA approved effective medications for treatment of AUD. Uh, recognized by researchers in, in the 1970s, fetal alcohol spectrum disorder has been a longstanding research priority for NIAAA with significant advances now in diagnosis and someday we hope in treatment and prevention. And then as alcohol associated liver disease contributes to increasing alcohol related mortality, treatment remains an unmet clinical need, but something we are researching. Alcohol and, uh, you know, current challenges and priorities include mental health conditions. Alcohol misuse often precedes uh, diagnosis of mental health problems in, in a help in, in, in an effort to cope with um, an effort to cope with some of the stress that uh, exacerbates one and the other. Uh, pain, al acute alcohol at binge levels may reduce pain, but chronic alcohol and withdrawal increase pain sensitivity. Uh, disrupted sleep, uh, persistent sleep problems during abstinence promote relapse and are a major impediment for recovery from alcohol use disorder. And then we have emerging trends in alcohol use in the population, alcohol use among women, gender gaps are narrowing for prevalence, early onset drinking, frequency and intensity of drinking, having an alcohol use disorder and many negative consequences of alcohol misuse and increasing alcohol use among senior adults, um, you know, is is a is an issue. This is my generation's cohort, and one in ten uh, individuals in this aged cohort uh, um, are engaging in binge drinking. And and to 
focus a little bit on the mental health uh, issue. Alcohol misuse correlates with poor mental health. It often precedes diagnoses of mental health conditions. It's commonly used um, in, in an effort to cope with symptoms. In, in the end, it makes the prognoses worse. Similarly, mental health conditions complicate treatment for alcohol use disorder. This uh, caption says, I'm right here in the room and no one even acknowledges me. Um, Paul Summergard, when he, he was president of APA and did his, his uh, plenary address, and we were uh, uh, re responsible for the NIH component of the American Psychiatric Association meeting that year, Paul said, if you've never seen uh, alcohol use disorder in your practice, you're delusional. Um, and, you know, one of our biggest goals, and, and this is something we expected you all will be helping us with, is that um, is closing the treatment gap. In the U.S., fewer than 10% of people with alcohol use disorder receive any form of treatment. Routine healthcare presents a unique opportunity for prevention, early intervention, and treatment of alcohol use disorder. However, many healthcare providers do not perform alcohol screening, are not aware, aware of evidence-based treatments, do not know where to refer patients for treatment. So our goals are to improve physician training and substance use prevention and treatment at all levels and integrate prevention, early intervention and treatment into routine health care. One of the things that we're going to be doing in this regard is developing a clinician's core resource. And when I define clinician here, I'm referring to every, everyone from a pharmacist to a nurse practitioner, to a physician's assistant, to a primary care doctor, to a board certified addiction medicine uh, specialist. And, you know, we um, are nearing the end of our efforts in this, and we'll be getting this out to a focus group soon. But the modules will include everything for, from prevention and primary care, the role of common co-occurring conditions, neuroscience, diagnostic criteria, evidence-based therapies and medications, addressing stigma and interactions with commonly used medications. And then to support research on recovery, um, we uh, for consistency across recovery research studies. In addition, NIAAA has engaged stakeholders to develop a consensus research, a research, I emphasize that definition of recovery. The proposed definition describes recovery as a process through which an individual pursues both remission from AUD and cessation of heavy drinking. So these are some of the things that we're currently working on. I wanna kind of wrap up by telling you about alcohol as a coping response I call this hyperkatifia. I'll tell you about that later, deaths of despair and COVID-19. Um, you, you know, pre-pandemic, alcohol-related deaths doubled from 1999 to 2017. The death, death rates were highest among men and middle-aged and older adults. The death rates increased over time across all age groups, except for 16 to 20 and 75 and older, and the increase in death rate was greater in women than men. Um, these statistics align with other recent reports that have highlighted changing trends in drinking patterns and increased consequences of alcohol in women and the aging population, as I alluded to earlier. Alcohol plays a prominent role in the deaths of despair, a, a term coined by Angus Deaton and Anne Case to reflect the, the factors that are uh, resulting in increased mortality in the United States. This is all pre-pandemic, I might add. Um, as opposed to the other Western countries where there's been a significant and straight line decrease in mortality over the last 20 years. And so what are the three factors that contribute to these deaths of despair? Well, they're in the graph and the, the diagram on the right, but drug overdoses, suicides, and, and liver disease I've already mentioned, and alcohol plays a role in each one of those. Um, and these patterns of increased mortality have been observed across many racial and ethnic groups and age groups now in more recent studies. And I just want to show you that to, dove, to, to loop back to the mental health part, any mental illness in the past year among adults age 18 or older uh, have been steadily increasing in, in, from 2008 to 2019. And you can see that these, uh, these numbers um, in, and the graph, this comes from uh, SAMHSA, and the difference between um, the, the uh, estimate and the 2019 estimate, um, it, this estimate in 2019 is statistically significant. So there, there is a significant increase in, in any mental illness. And this goes 
with depression as well. I'm not showing any of those slides, but I just want you to realize that we have multiple things that were going on even pre-pandemic. And then we add in the pandemic and we have a bi-directional relationship of alcohol use disorder. Um, so isolation and stress associated with the pandemic could lead to increased alcohol misuse. Um, physical distancing can lead to social isolation or loss of social support, which can lead to stress or precipitate relapse for those in recovery. Physical distancing also poses challenges for treatment and recovery. Telehealth and virtual meetings can be helpful options for individuals seeking treatment or in recovery from alcohol use disorder. Um, and there are also biological and behavioral issues. Um, the, the biological and behavioral effects of alcohol misuse could also exacerbate the pandemic. Alcohol produces behavioral disinhibition. I'm sure you're all familiar with that and may promote risky behavior and less compliance with guidelines to reduce the spread of the virus. A person, you know, alcohol is the social lubricant of our society, but um, being in an enclosed space, taking off your mask, bellowing in front of the person in front of you, uh, showing disinhibited um, behavior, um, you know, all the things that you're familiar with that that alcohol does is it in its even in it in low doses may indeed be helping spread the virus. And then alcohol compromises immune function. I'm not going to go into this in great detail, but um, alcohol is much more represented in acute respiratory distress syndrome pre-pandemic. We know that acute respiratory distress syndrome is a is a significant part of the severe pathology associated with hospitalization with COVID-19. Um, the cytokine surge that you see in COVID-19 is very similar to the cytokine surge you see in ARDS, which is exacerbated by alcohol misuse. So you get the picture. So, you know, the diagram on the right here that I've shown now, both slides indicates that there are multiple ways through behavior and also direct biological effects that um, misuse of alcohol can exacerbate the pandemic and the pandemic can exacerbate alcohol misuse. And just for a little more concrete data, surveys um, of consumers in the United States and elsewhere suggest that some people are drinking more while others are drinking less. For those that may be consuming more alcohol, limited data suggests that stress, which is one of my favorite topics, is a contributing factor. For instance, alcohol use increased among college students in March, particularly among those reporting higher levels of stress and anxiety. People who said their psychological well-being was impacted negatively over the, by the pandemic also reported more drinking days and more drinks per occasion. An Australian study found that 20% of people reported drinking more during the pandemic and, ha and about half of those endorsed stress, anxiety, boredom, or worry that COVID-19 uh, as reasons for drinking more. Um, such findings are concerning given that drinking to cope places a person on a slippery slope to alcohol use disorder. It's a form of misregulation. If you're drinking alcohol um, to reduce your stress, when the alcohol wears off, your stress is increased even more. And so you get into this vicious cycle of trying to fix the problem with, with the element that's actually causing the problem or making it worse. Um, and then in addition, increases in consumption can increase the risk of injuries at a time when many hospitals are inundated with sick patients. And finally, it's not on this slide, but we know that, uh, that in a few of these studies, women seem to be drinking more than men or increasing the drinking more than men during the pandemic. Um, I wanted to give a shout out to Alcoholics Anonymous and other 12-step programs. This, I just wanted to show you that I showed this slide at our National Advisory Council meeting uh, a few months ago, uh, a systemic review, which is listed below and published in the Cochrane Database Systems Review by Kelly Humphreys and Ferrari, uh, examined outcomes of uh, 10,000 participants from 27 studies. Um, you know, the problem I have is that uh, the uh, Zoom blocks out part of my actual um, texts here, so it makes it hard to read. <laughs> Um, and I never figured out, all right, uh, studies that compared peer-led Alcoholics Anonymous uh, or professionally delivered 12-step programs with other behavioral interventions such as motivational enhancement therapy or cognitive behavioral therapy, 12-step um, facilitation treatment variants or no treatment. So in other words, it was a comparison of, of standard behavioral treatments, but also with a variety of different 12-step facilitations across a variety of measures, 
AA performed at least as well as other behavioral treatments for a AUD, and AA was more effective in increasing abstinence, which should be no surprise to you all, and I've circled that in red there. Um, these results suggest that AA and 12-step facilitation can offer a low-cost, effective treatment option for maintaining abstinence among those with alcohol use disorder. And I would submit that I think I'm preaching to the choir here, but I just wanted to show you this is actually a very nice scientific review. So to summarize, you know, uh, addiction can be misuse or misregulation as a coping response. And we call this um, negative emotional state that's associated with withdrawal from alcohol. It's, it, you know, hyperkatifia. And, and you'll say, well, what, what on earth is that? Well, it's a word I made up. And it's supposed to be analogous to hyperalgesia. So what is hyperalgesia? Well, hyperalgesia is well known to be increased pain when a pain relief medication wears off. And it's now been well documented with opiates and alcohol, I might add, because alcohol relieves pain too, unfortunately at very high doses. Um, so, so I wanted a word to describe hypersensitive negative emotional state. So I invented hyperkatifia, which um, is the katifia is Greek for sadness or dejection or negative emotional state. And uh, our argument is that this uh, contributes to the withdrawal negative affect stage um, and, and of course has loading from a number of things that we consider allostatic loads. And so the argument is that on the top there, you see you know, that, that, we, that normal hedonic tone is maintained when you're not overusing a drug or alcohol in particular. And that's a return to homeostasis. But on the other hand, we know that, that there is a shift in that hedonic tone to ever negative state. And it's weighted down by genetics and epigenetics, childhood trauma, psychiatric comorbidity and excessive drinking. And that's the basically where we believe this allostatic load is focusing on the negative affect stage of the addiction cycle. I want to end by mentioning that NIAAA is committed to supporting a diverse research community and research on health disparities. Health disparities are highlighted by the COVID-19 pandemic and recent instances of social injustice with African Americans are a call to action for NIH and the entire scientific community. NIAAA recognizes that diverse research teams broaden the scope of scientific inquiry Bring, bring creative solutions to bear on complex scientific problems and encourage research relevant to the healthcare needs of underserved populations to eliminate health disparities and diversify the scientific workforce. NIAAA is committed to significantly increasing diversity and fully embracing inclusion in the scientific workforce, eliminating health disparities and funding among grantees from underrepresented groups, expanding health disparities research and ensuring that our research and outreach benefits underserved communities. You know, um, I, I want to mention that, you know, at the end, I mean, I, I sort of made it in the title, Challenges for Alcoholics Anonymous in the Pandemic and Post-Pandemic. And um, rigorous reviews of research on the mechanism of behavior change through which Alcohol Anonymous enhances recovery have found that AA typically confers benefits by mobilizing multiple therapeutic factors simultaneously, mostly through facilitating adaptive changes in social networks of participants, but also by boosting members' recovery coping skills, recovery motivation, abstinence, self-efficacy, and psychological well-being by reducing impulsivity and craving. And this is a quote from John Kelly in 2020. Um, so some of the areas that I think are important for you all are lack of of direct social interaction produces, uh, this produces unique challenges across the board for treatment of those struggling with AUD. Meetings are a cornerstone of AA, of course. Can, can online AA meetings provide the same social support as in-person meetings? How important is the physical and social context? I'm assuming you all are working on that, but we could actually use some research in this domain. Diversity issues are and will remain a challenge in alcohol treatment availability, stigma, research, and public health during the pandemic and post-pandemic. How do online meetings impact diversity? So, um, I, I, you know, I'm going to totally end now by, you know, 
letting you know we have a lot of publications. We have two really important websites, Rethinking Drinking and the NIAAA Treatment Navigator. I'm happy to explain them in more detail. Um, and you can help us uh, spread the word of our uh, 50th anniversary celebration on social media. Our website has been updated. It's a living document. So if you think that if you think there are things missing, you should let us know. And I want to um, just thank you all for listening. Um, I guess that's a sort of pun intended. And um, a special thanks to, to Rachel Anderson and Aaron White, who helped me with these slides and some of the conceptual framework. So I'm going to stop there. I'll be happy to answer any questions that anybody might have. Um, and I think I'm going to shop, stop sharing my screen. Thank you, Dr. Koob. That was fascinating and, and, uh, and very interesting. Several uh, people have asked if your slides will be made available. Uh, uh, can we share those slides with others? Yeah, you have them, Greg. I sent you the latest version. Yes, I, I do have them. And, and for those of you in the room, I, I will uh, share them. Um, uh, there are two ways to take questions and answers. One is to unmute and shout and wave your hand. Another is to use the um, uh, chat feature, or you can down, if you click on the participants, you can raise your hand and ask a question there. Uh, I, I'll ask one question, if I may, Dr. Koob. Um, a, a common topic in AA, or, or at least in, in the people I run with, is if there was a, a pill you could take that would kill your cravings and you could, you could go ahead and drink and have one drink and not be driven for more the way addictive people like me are, would you take that pill? Is a pill like that something that NIH or NIAAA is researching? Well, Greg, in some sense, we already have it um, because uh, naltrexone, which is also known, uh, you know, in the long acting version is Vivitrol. It really does kind of dull the, the uh, pleasurable effects of alcohol after the first drink. But, but it's not, you know, it's not, first of all, it's not effective with everyone um, in doing that. You know, its effect size is, is uh, around 0.3, uh, same as with the campersate, which is used more for the craving um, protracted abstinence phase. Um, and, and secondly, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure people would try to drink past it or stop taking their pill. Um, so I think that, you know, I think, you know, you, you all probably wonder, well, what do we recommend at NIAAA? What we recommend is what you recommend for the most part, which is abstinence, but we'll take anything we can get along the way. That's our, that's our perspective. And, you know, I think, I think I would rather try to develop medications, and that's where we're putting our focus, on, you know, reestablishing that hedonic homeostasis so that there's no longer the craving or the need to uh, drink excessively and build with that, of course, behavioral treatments. I don't think there's ever gonna be a pill to treat any mental illness that does not involve also rebuilding your life in a sense, rebuilding your connections, rebuilding your environment, reducing your trauma, uh, working through some of your trauma, reducing the stressors in your environment. I mean, all of those things are, are critical. I mean, you know, I think it's, you all know better than I, but I, I, I would I would assume you don't recommend hanging out with drinkers once you've decided that you're going to go abstinent. And, you know, I think we have to we have to pay attention to those issues. And I, I, so having having a pill that, where you could just say, well, I'm going to go out and have I can go out and have one drink. I, you know, um, I think it's it's never going to work. That's my gut reaction. I don't Thank have any you. data. Uh, I see some hands raised. Uh, Mike Lee had a question. Hey, uh, thank you for your talk. That was absolutely fascinating. Um, I wondered if you could answer one of the questions that's on the slide. Uh, can online AA meetings provide the same social support as in-person meetings? And how important is the physical and social context? Yeah, well, we don't know the answer to that. I'm kind of oh. hoping <laughs> that you all are going to find the answer to that. Um, we do have a uh, funded studies now that are going to be looking at some of these issues. But if there is a silver lining to the pandemic, it is that hopefully clever people will come up with clever ways of making 12-step facilitation programs work better 
through online mechanisms. Uh, you know, I don't know how many of you saw some of the conventions, but uh, the political conventions, but I, I thought it was remarkable in some sense. And, and Greg was telling me that you all can now have meetings where, which is probably a better example, uh, where there's somebody represented in virtually every state of the union. So there's some things that we might be able to do better, um, even even more pedestrian. It turns out that now at NIH, that we're doing all our presentations and, and um, you know, seminars and, and special lectures virtually, we're having double, triple, quadruple the number of individuals participate. It, it is more than a little challenging is what I wanna say. But I, I think that maybe we'll find ways of doing better cognitive behavioral therapy, doing better motivational interviewing, doing, you know, um, other uh, therapies, uh, mindfulness through the virtual world, um, maybe through avatars. I don't know. You know, you can you can think far out. Maybe we put on um, those things that put us in a three dimensional space. I forget what they're <laughs> called, but you, you know. So anyway, I'm I'm the eternal optimist, but. Um, I, I think it is a challenge, and and that's um, and and the benefit post pandemic would be we have rural communities where you probably have to drive a hundred miles to find an AA meeting uh, 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 that that fits your particular needs, and so you know maybe this would be helpful for people who can't get get to a, a doctor maybe or or a, or a meeting or a a, um, a therapist. Those are my thoughts. There was one here about, can I briefly outline some of the genetic components of alcohol addiction? In particular, is there a genetic component involved in opiate, benzo, and other addictive substances? Yeah, the heritability for alcohol use disorder and other addictions is about 0 0.5, 0 0.6. And what that means is that, as Mark Chuckett would always say, there is a genetic loading, but it doesn't mean you're pre predestined, all right? One of the interesting things that have come out, uh, and Mark gave a talk at our 50th anniversary symposium, but he's been following a cohort of individuals who had a family history of alcohol use disorder for now three generations. And one of the fascinating things about this cohort is that they typically have a very low response to alcohol. It's opposite of what you might think intuitively. And, and he calls it low, low sensitivity, a low, a high, uh, low, low sensitivity or low, low response to alcohol. I call it inherent tolerance. But because of that, these individuals tend to drink more and more to try and get that initial effect. And because of that, they do a lot more damage to their brains and their bodies. And, and the genetics that seem to be involved in some of this is obviously um, there's a good bit of data on alcohol metabolizing enzymes. So if you're Asian American and you're missing the allele for acetaldehyde dehydrogenase, or you're missing both alleles for alcohol dehydrogenase, you probably don't drink at all because if you even take a sip, you're gonna get dizzy and, and nauseous and so forth. And that's a very dramatic example of genetics. Other, uh, other elements are some of the ones we know and love from uh, neurobiology, the GABAergic receptor, a potassium channel that we know is particularly sensitive to alcohol. There is uh, some of the stress neurotransmitter systems that, that I know and love are showing genetic loading in some subgroups of individuals. So, but one thing I can say for sure, it's not one gene, it's going to be multiple genes and multi-determined, much like depression or, or any other mental illness. What does an AAA think about baclofen, which some therapists recommend for alcohol cravings? Um, baclofen is approved in France. Um, the problem with baclofen is that, and I doubt it will ever get through the FDA, is that it has some pretty severe okay. side effects if you drink uh, with the alcohol, uh, with the baclofen. Um, it, you know, it, it's approved for spasticity and multiple sclerosis in this country, but those are probably individuals not getting behind the wheel of a car and drinking at the same time. And the, the one benefit that it, appears to be the case with baclofen is that in individuals with liver disease, it's been used in Europe uh, as an aid because it, it's, um, it doesn't interact with the liver and cause any um, problems with alcohol interactions in the liver. But I want to point out to you that neither does a camprosate uh, get metabolized by the liver nor gabapentin. And a camprosate is approved by the FDA for as an anti-craving medication 
and gabapentin is used on the VA formulary because it certainly seems to help with protracted abstinence and sleep disturbances um, and helps uh, normalize sleep in alcohol use disorder. It's not officially approved by the FDA, but it is on the VA formulary. So that's what I know about Baclofen. I mean, it, it was really promoted in France by Olivier Amazon, who was a physician, to uh, Mitterrand, who was the premier of France. And so he had a lot of influence because he self-treated himself with Baclofen. But I know I knew Olivier, he's, he's passed on and he took enormous doses of Baclofen, okay? So um, I think we'd have to be careful in this country where everybody's driving. And, no, I, and, and I don't think it'll get through the FDA in its current formulation um, because of the side effects. Uh, is, is it a good target? Maybe. The GABA, there's a whole bunch of, to end on a positive note, there's a whole bunch of other medications that may hit that target that could be useful, and those are under investigation. Uh, thank you. Uh, Noel from London had a question. How could Dr. Silkworth's doctor opinion be uplighted in the light of research from neuroscience? Um, I'm not sure what Dr. Silkworth's doctor opinion is. Could you explain to me, Noel? Hi, Dr. Cobb. Um, yeah, it's the um, Dr. Silkworth, as, uh, as far as I can tell, qualified, you know, got medically qualified as a physician in 1900. And that's kind of the Bible in the twelve by in the in the big book about how what the nature of the illness is. But we've had, you know, whatever it is, hundred and twenty years of uh, you know recent neuroscience and more extensive use of cognitive therapy. So I guess it's it's maybe a slight tangent to what you're talking about, but I just wondered if you had any thoughts on recent neuroscience and research that would could imply how a doc, that doctor's opinion, uh, Joe might be able to better explain exactly what the doctor's opinion says. Uh, and in the light of that research, how could it possibly be updated? Thanks, Noel. Yeah, it was the allergy theory, the theory of uh, alcoholism being an allergy back in 1935. Okay. Yeah. Well, I think you could broaden it and, and make it more generalizable today that the allergy is many of the allostatic loads that I uh, indicated there. So some people um, may have been abused as children and had uh, childhood trauma. Some people may have a genetic loading. Maybe they were born with too much of stress hormones in their brain. I mean, heaven forbid. Some people... Uh, may be uh, living with individuals who have severe alcohol use disorder, both of them. So there's, there's a, a, you know, an addition environmental thing. And, and you could argue that that vulnerability um, is in sense an allergic, allergic kind of response. And that's how I would look at it. And so we know now that there are burn, brain circuitry changes that those traumas, those environmental uh, factors challenge in the brain. So if you hype up your stress system, you're more likely to drink to cope with stress. If, if your frontal cortex is not working because of a whole bunch of reasons, trauma can do that. Maybe even, you know, a, a severe concussion from playing football as a 12 year old could do that. We don't know. I mean, but you know, let's, speculate that you could have a concussion by skateboarding as a 12 year old. I don't want to pick on football, but um, you know, the, the, the fact is that if your frontal cortex isn't working right, um, you may be very impulsive, which is going to lead you as a teenager to more likely to engage in drinking and other um, behaviors of that sort. And, and so I, I think you could call that an allergy, but I call it a vulnerability. And I would just translate the word from allergy to vulnerability, and I would link it up to brain structures. I mean, think of ADHD, uh, uh, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. Those individuals are certainly much more likely to, to drink or even more so take stimulant drugs to self-medicate, okay? Because they already have a frontal cortex that maybe is a little out of whack or needs restructuring or retraining 
Um, and, and, you know, some of that can occur. The earlier we pick up on some of these uh, childhood vulnerabilities, the, the better is the treatment uh, with extra attention and, and extra work in certain areas like cognitive um, therapy. So that's, I guess that's the way I would Dr. put it. Coop. Um, how many research that connects binge drinking and heavy drinking to heart disease? Yes, there's a good bit of work out there. Um, you can look not only on our website, but on the Heart Lung Institute's website that uh, heavy drinking and excessive drinking basically does to your heart what it does to your liver. All right. So I'm putting it, I'm not an expert on this, but my uh, division director, Kathy Young, could regale you with all the details. She's the director of the metabolism and health effects of alcohol. Um, Dr. Koo, before you 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 uh, take another hand, I, I'm seeing Alan from Ireland waving his hand. Uh, Alan, would you unmute yourself? Or let's see thank you I very can... much. Thank you, Greg. Dr. Uh, Koo, thank you so much. I find that most informative uh, with regards to allergies and and magic bullets and special pills. And whatnot. My understanding of alcoholism is that uh, until the sufferer is prepared, number one, to recognize that they're in trouble and are prepared to do something about it, recovery cannot be imposed on an alcoholic. Uh, our penal institutions have tried, it hasn't worked. And um, uh, aversion treatment has been tried, it doesn't work. Any of my brothers and sisters like myself, who came to the point, and generally a bad point in life as a result of excessive drinking, were prepared initially to do something about it. And I was very fortunate to meet people in Alcoholics Anonymous who supported and understood me. Very quick one, the Zoom meetings have been absolutely phenomenal. They've been an acid test. Again, it has concentrated the mind, not only of the sufferer, but also of those people who are living in recovery. And I have seen a very positive response to the, the circumstances. And we, in our group, have people who are now seven and eight months sober and who are in service. We've supported them greatly. We've also, we also meet them outside of uh, our houses and we go for coffee, etc. We also enjoy the privilege of getting people from around the world, United States and Canada, etc., to come to our groups and we get a broader uh, sense of a, a experience in a Dr. Koob, thank you so much. Well, that, that's very encouraging to hear. And thanks for those comments. And I, I couldn't agree more. I, I, you know, I think one of the things we'd like to facilitate is having people who everyone looks up, up to in the health professional field do screening for alcohol use disorder. And I can tell you that I've been doing nothing if if and if I've been doing nothing during the um, uh, during the pandemic with my co uh, institute directors, I'm trying to wedge alcohol questions into every cohort we're studying in NIH. So um, I'm probably they're probably going to start getting mad at me soon. But uh, nevertheless, we've been trying to get the audit C into every cohort in NIH to find out, you know, what exactly is going on, so we'll know. As you point out, where are these vulnerabilities lie when 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 we when we do start getting back together? So you know, I I, I totally agree. I you know, but a, a skilled doctor can ask two questions. You know, a primary care doc or a physician's assistant, just two questions. You know, how much do you drink and how much do your friends drink, and that, that can get thing get things started. You know, we're also working, by the way, with the with the liver docs. Um, very very. Um, engaged with this now and, and where in a sense you could argue that some of the things they pick up a liver doc picks up could be a biomarker for alcohol use disorder and so you know you know my dream is the same as Kevin Kuntz who's head of uh, not head of but he's the power behind the scenes with uh, ACAM the um, organization that certifies addiction medicine specialists in the United States you know, it, my dream is that someday we have, uh, I got in trouble with using this word SWAT team because it, you know, I guess it has negative connotations in the United States, but you know, that we would have a team that would descend on the emergency room um, like you have for a cardiovascular event. You go in and have a heart attack in the United States, there's a team of people that you're immediately connected with who do all the things that they're supposed to do to keep you from dying. 
we need the same thing when somebody shows up in an emergency room virtually unconscious from alcohol. And we need a team there that's going to move them into uh, a, a treatment and, and that, that piece that you illustrated so well in what you said about they're going to want, need to want to, to fix the problem. They're going to want to change. I'm, I'm open to anything, Greg, and as long as you want, but um, I, I think it's gotten past the point where I can follow all the chat questions. I understand, you, Dr. Koob. Um, if you want to save them, if your IT people can save the chat questions, you can send them to me an email. I'll do my best over time to uh, to, to answer. Thank you. I, I will take you up on that, and, and I'll be in touch with your staff about that. Um, we, we had scheduled the rest of this hour uh, to talk about diversity in secular AA and, and forming new groups, not not just about alcohol, but I, I know at least one person who wants to to join to uh, establish an Overeaters Anonymous secular uh, program. And you're welcome to to stick with us all day long, Dr. Koob. Uh, you have the schedule, uh, but but I know you're interested in diversity and. Uh, Joe, do we want to start that now, or do we want to? Uh... Yeah, I think we can maybe blend. Um, uh, Dr. Kub was asking about people's experience with Zoom, and we'd love to hear about your experience with LGBTQ meetings, young people's meetings, women's meetings, just secular meetings, uh, or any sort of uh, recovery meetings overall. Uh, and uh, if you want to slip in a question directly for Dr. Koob uh, as we go through that, um, I know there's plenty more of those to come as well. At one, at one o'clock Eastern time, though, we, we do have another presentation scheduled for this room, although uh, so, this room so is Greg, supposed to hold 500 and it, it, it doesn't. So... I'm not sure how we're going to treat that. Joe, do you have an answer? I, I have a message into uh, uh, Zoom right now to find out why it's capping at 100 because we pay for 500. Th uh, thank you. Yeah, meanwhile, I, I'd like to hear who all is here from other places other than the United States and particularly uh, people who have formed special purpose uh, AA groups. And if you have you know, a brief description of, of that process. And, and I, I'm all in favor of just uh, hollering out. Unmute yourself if you can. I posted Hello, the link. Thank you uh, very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes. It's Sean here. I'm from the UK. Uh, uh, I live in the uh, Brecon Beacons in Wales. I, um, thank you very much for the meeting. And thank you very much, Dr. Coop. Um, I'm Sean. I'm an alcoholic, I should say. Uh, yeah, back in uh, about 1980, I started a, uh, an, a Hedens meeting in London. And a, uh, a, a, we actually changed the name of it because the full title I wanted for it wouldn't fit into the uh, headquarters database. So I called it a um, Agnostics, Freethinkers, etc. And they, we closed the meeting closed after a few years. Like I told everybody, like we'd all become atheists, so we didn't bother anymore. I've been going to AA ever since. I kind of got sober and stayed sober in regular AA meetings. And I kind of took my own brand of atheism along there. Like, and they converted many people along the way, like I'm pleased to say. Like I gave them license or legit, legitimized their being non-believers. Um, the um, pro the wonders about Zoom is uh, it's connected all us uh, atheist stuff and non-believers. Uh, it's because uh, uh, yeah, I used to think like there's all sorts of wonderful atheist agnostic, uh, agnostics meetings in kind of the West Coast of America. Well, two or three years ago, like I was in San Francisco in 1980, I think, and there wasn't any there then. Uh, I was there two or three years ago, like, and I went to an atheist meeting, which wasn't actually on. I went to one in Seattle, which was a bit of a washout like. So uh, I went to some very good ones in New York, I will say, like there was plenty of people there. But the thing about it now is that we're all connected up. And this is very important that we're all connected up. We're not alone and we can kind of contact with each other. There's a wonderful list of uh, meetings going around, worldwide list of secular uh, AA meetings like, and it helps us keep in touch with each other. And it just, uh, it legitimizes how we feel, our feelings about its religion, God, etc. So I'll shortly be going back. We've got a little meeting here in our town. Uh, we'll be going back to that now at the beginning of next year. Like we only get six or eight people there. 
uh, and it's wonderful. And they, uh, but we'll be doing it on Zoom as well. It'll be a mixture. And uh, that's what can, uh, a lot of meetings will be going back to. So people who have got special needs, people who can't travel, etc., uh, can come along, like people who are vulnerable, like especially because we're not going to be vaccinated for another six months or so. So it's a boom for that sort of thing, for minorities or for people who can't actually get to meetings. Or pe- people who went, I, I went to meetings in, the, uh, in Colorado Springs, and I thought I was in the little house in the prairie. If I had have got sober in that, I would have been straight. If I had have gone there, first of all, I couldn't have connected to that at all. Like you know, so I'm very pleased. Like that, a uh, um, this we're we're connecting up now worldwide. Thanks to th- th- thanks to Zoom. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Uh, someone else from elsewhere, who's got a hand up? Lucy, Kathy. No, I'm telling you that Lucy from the UK has her hand up. Oh, sorry, I should have taken it down. It's I was going to ask Dr. Coop something, but we've moved on, and I'm busy writing him an essay instead. <laughs> hey, my, my name is uh, Mikey. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, one thing that Zoom has brought us, uh, my home group has a meeting, but then after the meeting, we have an informal beginner's meeting where we're able to take some of the members aside that want to talk about you know, beginner's issues or how to get a sponsor, stuff like that, where we couldn't do that with our normal meeting. Um, I think that's an advantage that Zoom has brought us as opposed to uh, as something that's unique to uh, Zoom, not to mention, you know, we get a ton of people and people always say how grateful they are. Uh, same with the LBGT uh, QAI uh, meetings. Uh, a lot of people in certain places don't have those type of meetings to go to. And I think that's one of the things that makes Zoom so incredible. And Zoom does work because we have members that are now going on eight or nine months and all they have done is Zoom meetings. They haven't done any, uh, they haven't done any, uh, regular face-to-face meeting. So I think other than the f- social part and you don't hear as much laughter uh, with everybody on mute, but basically the Zoom meetings really do seem to work. Thanks. Thank you. I, is is Mario here? We have a, a gentleman who wanted to address us in Spanish this morning, and I don't know if he got into this room or not. My name's Noe. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, everyone. Hi, Good. Good morning. It's good to be here. And it's really, that was a really exciting talk by the doctor uh, just before this. And uh, I'm truly encouraged. Here in San Francisco, we have atheist, agnostic, free thinkers, and others meetings four days a week and a woman's meeting on top of that. And since Zoom, it's been wonderful to go all over the world. Someone suggested going to 50 meetings in 50 states in 50 days. I'm not that ambitious. But uh, I also wanted to add that the Yale study, uh, relapse prevention, pause, uh, uh, or re, uh, an article in Yale study of medical uh, on relapse prevention has been really beneficial to me and to people in our group. And so just keep, uh, encourage everyone to keep coming back and thank you for your support. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer Lucy's email, and then I'm going to say goodbye. Anybody else who wants to reach me, if you could go to Greg, I'm happy to answer as, much, as best we can. You know, some of these, are, I am really, really heartened to hear about how wonderfully the Zoom is working for AA. So keep up the good work and get as innovative as you can and let us know about it. So Thank goodbye. you, Dr. Koob. Thank you very much. I think the rest of us, if 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 you want to take five minutes, uh, don't leave the room. If you want to stay and hear the 1 p.m., uh, it came from the kitchen with with Maria Hornbacher and others. I see that Mario's back in. If he has his question in Spanish. Oh, Mario, hello. Were, would you like to address the group in Spanish? My name is Mario. I, I have a colleague. My name no, is Mario. She's an alcoholic. Soy Mario, soy un alcoholico. Um, Buenos dias, soy, Mario. Soy también un alcoholico anónimo ateo. Quisiera darles la información que tenemos grupos de ateos y agnósticos 
dos grupos, un grupo que lo conformamos muchos compañeros de América Latina, España, Australia. Tenemos reuniones los días lunes, miércoles, viernes, a las 7 de la noche, hora del este, hora de Nueva York. También tenemos reuniones los días jueves, reuniones de estudio y utilizamos los libros seculares, especialmente el de Jeffrey Mo, sobre A sin Dios. También tenemos reuniones los días domingos a las 2 p.m. hora de, de Nueva York. Estas reuniones de los domingos son especiales porque estamos conectados a América y Europa. Eh, también tenemos otra, otro grupo que se llama Paris Agnostic. Este grupo funciona los días sábados a las 11 a.m., hora de, del este, hora de Nueva York. Y somos, estamos conformados por muchas nacionalidades. Este, yo soy alcohólico y he, llegué, llegué al programa de Alcohólicos Anónimos un 2 de diciembre del 2009. Esta semana cumplí 11 años. Me mantengo sobrio a través de la asistencia a los grupos hispanos aquí en la ciudad de Montreal, Canadá. Entonces, muchas gracias por, por, eh, por este espacio. Y también quisiera aportar también eh, a los compañeros, porque yo pertenezco a los grupos de ateos y agnósticos en francés. Moi aussi, ya partí en el grupo de agnósticos y es ateos, y sí, en la región de, de Montreal, la provincia de Quebec, y al grupo de libre pensor, que se reunió el mercredi y el dimanche a 7 horas de Montreal. Así que el grupo eh, La Unión fue la Force, es un grupo de um, a lengua francesa que se reunió el le, le jeudi a 7h30. Entonces, es eso, mis amigos. Eh, thank you, Joe. Eh, Joe Geldon. Eh, y muchas gracias, Mario. Muchas gracias a la conferencia secular de internacional. Gracias. Thank you, Thank Mario. You. Uh, I think we'll, those of you who want to join the other room, uh, that's where I'm, I need to go. Uh, but if you want to stay in this room, just stay in this room. Uh, does anyone need a link to the other room? No, we need a link. There's the link to the, to the other room. It's called the Oh My God Room. Are mostly agnostic group of drunks. Thanks for listening to this audio version of the International Conference of Secular AA 2020. For more recordings, visit aasecular.org. There you will find our resources, information on upcoming conferences, and plenty of audio from previous conferences as well. Thanks for listening.